please welcome Paul Selig to the show. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're so welcome. All the way from Maui, mm -hmm. um, having a rainstorm, which is, you know, what we expect a lot in times in, in the islands of Hawaii, which I just love. Um, so here we are. I'm looking at Paul Selig on this Zoom um, recording. And if I look back to, to like 2010, maybe 20, what was that? You know, 23 years, 10, 13 years ago, um, I started um, reading your books and learning about you. And here I am, started a podcast almost four years ago. And if I would have dreamed to have a guest on, it would be me looking at you. Thank you. So the guides have been my teachers and you have been the facilitator. Mm -hmm. What I would like, this show is called Uncover Your Magic, Paul. And when I started this podcast, I didn't know it was an inspired thought. It was something that came through me that said, Ashley, start a podcast. And now I need to find a name. And I, and it was uncovering, I just knew everyone had magic. And I want everyone to know that. And I know we all have these gifts. And when I look back at your life, Paul, I look back and I kind of wanted to start because for the most part, I'm sure my listeners who listen to this show know you. But the ones that don't, just to bring us to where we are today, could we go back to when you turned 20, when you were 25 in St. Paul, Minnesota, in that hotel and kind of where that began? Well, yeah, I was living in New York. I was working in St. Paul for a few days and um, I had hit a real wall in my life. It was a crisis, although I couldn't really name the crisis, but I knew I was in one. And, um, you know, the Gideons leave these books in the drawers of hotel rooms. And um, I'd been raised sort of an atheist, so I wasn't all that inclined to uh, to take it out. but. It said prayer for people in crisis. So I said the prayer and I meant it and um, forgot about it. And three days later, I was back in New York and I asked myself what I could do for myself that day. It was positive and I heard a voice and it was told me to get my act together and how to do it. And I was so startled that I listened to it. And when I say I heard a voice, it wasn't a voice in the room. It was a thought that crowded out all other thoughts that had uh, the, the the resonance of truth with it that I couldn't deny. And so I acted on what I heard and my life began to change and, you know, has continued to change, you know, ever since. Right. So when you say change, you started, you started like listening to the voices, which you no. call the guides. No, that came later. I'd listened to what I was told. I was basically told to stop drinking and messing with drugs and all those things that I was doing. I was a year out of graduate school at Yale. I was probably in retrospect, a bit of a hot mess on every level. Um, but no, I, I changed my behavior in a big way. And I found myself suddenly on a spiritual path that I wasn't anticipating. And then everything changed. You go from living in a world where maybe there is a God or something you might call God and from one where there isn't. It's like moving to another planet. And that's what it felt like for me. It was quite a time and very confusing and very, very, very hard. I have to say I was very poor and very lost. And my psychic abilities started opening up shortly thereafter. And that was a process too. I didn't just arrive doing this. I was really supported and trained in doing this through years of experience with it. But I started seeing little lights around people. Um, and I was sent to somebody who did energy healing to get a context for it. And this was, you know, way back in the day, 87, 88, I guess this would have been you know, where everybody and their sister wasn't a Reiki master. It was a very rare thing back in the right. day. And, um, but I studied a form of energy healing after working with somebody for a while, a different form than I just mentioned, and um, was volunteering at a center for people that were living with life-challenging illness. It was the height of the AIDS epidemic, and 
people were dying all around me. And um, I found that when I had my hands on people's bodies, I started to hear things for them that they would they would they would agree with they would hear you know they would support the information and that's how i began to trust what i was getting and beginning to feel in my own body and the channeling came after that but it came slowly they, they didn't start lecturing through me as they do now which is in book form or lecture form until 2008 so i've been at this for a while um and that was when i quit smoking and they told me i had to quit smoking Right. They, and they said they would like they said they don't say I have to do anything they said we would like to continue to work with you but you're going to have to attend to this if we're able to do that and I quit and that's when the lecture started and you know the books began maybe about a year after that if, if, if even that long it was uh, quite a process and now my guides have dictated what I'm um, there on the 12th now they've started to work on the 12th book right have they ever um explain to you are you part of that group and have you do you have a soul contract with them that you said you would come down and you know go through that you know your 20s and you know have the darkness and experience you know the drinking and the drugs and all that i had a rotten childhood i mean i had a hard time you know some people have a hard time i had a hard time nothing glorious about it everybody has a hard time once in a while but um they don't talk about soul contracts they did say that i agreed to this before i came in and that i've worked with them before that much i've heard um but i i actually make a point of of not sort of glorifying this or my role in it um i don't know how this happened i was not somebody who even necessarily believed in channeling I am not a good new ager. I have very little patience with a lot of woo woo. You know, it's just who I am. I'm an old New Yorker and I'm a bit of a curmudgeon, less than I used to be. But, you know, I am on this great adventure with this stuff um, that I may never fully, fully comprehend. And um, I, I think it's a very unique skill set that I possess. And maybe not that unique. Maybe I've just been at it a long time. You know, I did a group in my apartment for 18 years in New York. I was teaching college. I wasn't looking to be known as a psychic or a channeler. Um, but in those 18 years, I believe I was developed and prepared for the work that I now do. And even my time in the classroom is preparing me for what I now do, because those are skills that, that get utilized when I have to facilitate as Paul, a, a group of students. Um, but yeah, so maybe I, I think, yeah, I think I've been at it a while. Um, but I, if anybody told me why I would wind up doing this when I was, you know, 21 years old, I would have thought they were insane. You know, really. Right. So when you have the gift of mediumship, but with the living, yeah. that's different to me. Yeah, I guess it is. I mean, I, if somebody still has a body, I can generally hear them. And that includes people in comas and locked in syndrome and, you know, different kinds of disabilities. I'm actually pretty accurate, I'm told, when I step into people and I can hear. Um, I call it stepping in. If somebody's on the other side, if somebody asked me to tune in to say their, their Aunt Frida, who's been dead for 20 years, I may get her. But I generally get them as they were when they were alive, sometimes as they're crossing, which is interesting. Um, and once in a while, if they're around, they want to come through, perhaps they will. But I call myself a medium for the living. Um, I, I think of myself as a switchboard. So when I'm channeling the guides, I'm plugged into their station or radio might be a better metaphor. So I'm a radio. They're the station, the guides that play when I'm channeling. But if I'm reading for a client, I'm tuning into the client, they're the radio station. And if the client asks for somebody, asks about somebody in their life, I'm switching stations to tune into them in a relationship with the client. And I often, I'm told, begin to look like the person I'm stepping into and right. take on their mannerisms. And I find that interesting and kind of fascinating because I like that it, it proves out stuff. You know, with channeling, the guides that work through me come with energy that's generally very palpable for people. The books are energetic transmissions and the live workshops, people can feel the energy. It's quite, quite apparent. 
Um, but the teachings are esoteric teachings. They're mystical teachings. They're laid out in a way that we can understand them and employ them, I hope, after all these books. But when I'm doing a psychic reading, which is a different skill set, somebody just wants to know why their 25 year old daughter isn't speaking to them anymore, I can step into that, and that's provable. You know, and you go, well, it's about that conversation you had at the wedding. You know, oh my God, that was it? Yeah, like that. You know, it's, it can be that specific at times. So it's a useful set, and often I can hear how these things can be supported and change, how things might be healed in some way. Um, and I like doing that work. I find it interesting. I do a lot of it when I do live streams now. I do, I see less people privately, you know, on Zoom calls like this than I used to. But I do a lot of these things when I'm doing groups because, you know, you can, you can read fast and I tend to be very, very quick when I'm reading. Yeah. So that, so I understand you don't meditate. You don't read other books. You don't, I mean, how do you get into that? You just, it just comes like when, when I'm watching you um, channel the guides, you, mm -hmm. it's this instant, you know, a lot of people that channel have to get into a state, have to close their eyes, but you don't, and they, and they meditate <laughs> and they do all this other prep work. Well, if I were to meditate, I'd probably have a better time on the planet. Um, <laughs> And that's my lack of, you know, patience or focus. I mean, when I'm working, I'm working in an altered state of consciousness. I had my brain wired up by some neurologists once or neuroscientists, and they said, oh, my God, your, your waking state is like a, a monk that's been meditating his whole life, you know? Oh, wow. Yeah, but that's not my experience at all. I'm, in, you know, I'm neurotic and worry and all those things. So I was surprised to hear that. And I don't necessarily give it value because it's not my experience of being. When I first started channeling and hearing, and this would have been in my early 30s when I was first starting with groups, and I'm in my early 60s now, so 30 years ago, I used to feel like I had a tin can on a string up to my ear and somebody else had the other tin can and was speaking into it and I was so worried that I wouldn't be able to hear it or the string would be broken that I would be in a panic and I was starting to do groups and all these people were showing up you know going oh my god people expect something I mean I don't know what I'm doing um and I was about to do a group once in Connecticut and I heard from, like, I heard, may we have permission to merge? And I said, okay. And ever since then, I don't feel like I have to go anywhere. It's just present. And it really is. It's just like turning a radio dial. You know, the station's always there. You just have to tune into it. And that's how I work. Same with the right. mediumship. Yeah. So I, do, I respect other people and their processes. I'm not a trained channel. I'm not a trained medium. You know, this happened and I've had to work with it and learn through it. That's why I don't teach it, because I don't really know how it happens. If the guides ever want to teach it one day, that'd be great. But I don't have the answer for other people this way. I do know you have to show up even when you don't want to, that it's not about me or the channel. The channel's the radio. And when you make it about yourself, it gets tricky because you know, it, it gets informed by other things. Right. And, um, and in my case, at least, almost without exception, the ability has always been for other people more so than myself. People assume this gets me what I want, and it's given me a, a lovely life. I'm having a life right now that I didn't expect I would have, which is basically by my letting go of who I thought I was supposed to be, other things came to replace those things that are, 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 are things I wouldn't even have known to ask for or wish for. So I'm very grateful most of the time. But anyway, it's, um, it's always come in service to others. And not that I wanted to be a helper because I didn't want to be a helper. You know, I was, you know, I really didn't. You know, I just didn't want to be in pain. You know, I didn't want to be worried. I didn't want to be unhappy anymore. And I knew for me early on that spirit or God or whatever you want to call it was something that seemed to call me or claim me or something happened. 
that made that important. And I remember asking once, I was studying with a teacher, a healing teacher who's no longer living, and she said in this workshop, okay, everybody, you write down one thing, and you're going to get it, and I'm going to give you the prayer that's going to bring it to you, but be very careful how you write it down, and I did. But I think at the time, and I was maybe 32 years old, maybe 33, I was just wanted to, I mean, I just, I'd had enough experience or proof that there was something more that I knew that that's all I wanted. So I just asked if I could go all the way with this. And I actually some days think that that's what the books are. The books right. are where they go there, you know, and they're, they're, they're coming through me. And I'm a student of the work. I'm not, I'm not a spiritual teacher. That's not my job in the world. Right. Somebody else gets to do that, which is terrific. But I don't know. That's it. Yeah. You know, I want to go to your mom because I was, you know, being raised as an atheist, Mm-hmm. You know, and that's part of, I look at life and, in you know, how you, who you chose as your parents and mm-hmm. the lessons that they're instilling in you to believe that. And I remember you were at a book signing one time at Barnes and Noble, and she was in the front row mm-hmm. and you were reading something from your book and you kind of saw a sadness or she didn't, she didn't know that part of you. No idea. No idea who I was. And I think it was, uh, I think it threw her. I think it had to displace a number of ideas that she had had with probably very good reason about who her son was. And this was a part of my life that up until the time of the first book, I wasn't talking a lot with my family. They weren't that interested. You know, they really weren't. Now my mother's, oh, you've been given this great gift. I mean, it's like, well, my mother is, you know, 87 with dementia now. We have a very different relationship than we did. but yeah, she and my father both, my father was a German Jew who got shuttled out of Germany during the kinder transport, which is where they took the Jewish kids out, the two that got out to go to school wow. abroad. And my mother, as I learned in my, just really in the last few years, had been abused by a minister. Um, and she had been devout, which I never knew. I just knew we were, neither of them believed in anything. And um, so I grew up with a void there. And uh, I think in some ways I'm grateful for the void because I didn't have horrible baggage to unpack Mm -hmm. um, as I might have. I wasn't disenfranchised by organized religion. I just didn't know a lot about it. I had a wacko year in parochial school and only because it was cheap that I went there. And... uh, Mm -hmm. And I kind of thought the nuns were a trip and I didn't understand what they were talking about, you know, but I liked it. And I met friends that I still have, strangely enough. And that was 1969, 70 or something, one year. But that was it. I didn't come with this stuff. So I, in some ways, what I did have, in retrospect, was a very pure and perhaps childlike desire for God or something that I wanted to believe in that I hadn't been allowed to believe in because I didn't think I could. That was it, I didn't think I could. I didn't think, you know, I mean, it was something that I snickered at. And um, I'm not knocking organized religion. It's a it's a way forward for many, um, but you know, I, in retrospect, only in retrospect, can see how well I was cared for and shuttled forward through my life to do the work that I do now. Um, that, that's apparent to me now. But at the time, I was like, oh, my God, what a mess this all is. Because it was. It sure felt that way. Right. Oh, I just, you know, I've just finished uh, Resurrection. And I know that's the, you're on to the next book of the three, the trilogy of manifestation and um, just coming off of that and listening to, I did the audible. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm coming from your first book, um, the, tr- what the, what's the first book in 2010? I am the word. The I am the word. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Coming and watching the progression, you know, and watching your growth and 
um, how you've, I mean, when you used to transcribe them and send them to the, you know, and type them out, and now you have this, you know, way, a much better um, way of doing it, much more efficient. But I'm watching the progression. And is it, are, are the guides teaching you? Are you like, do you feel like you look back at your life and in 2009, when you just started, like, I think this, when they told you we're going to write a book and you write it in two weeks to this next book that you're writing, what is the difference in that, in Paul, in that person in 2009 versus 2023? Well, it's a lot. I mean, first, I don't write the books. The books are all spoken and then transcribed. So all of the books are transcripts of spoken teachings. There's no writing involved at all. Um, and I did transcribe the first few books. It takes longer to transcribe than it does to channel. And now other people do it. And I'm very, very, very grateful for that. I don't usually read the book until I have to sit down and do the audio book in the recording studio. And that's when I actually read through the whole thing and go, wow, this makes sense. I still struggle with some of the things I struggled with then, but a lot of things I don't. And there are things that I thought would never leave me and always be a source of pain that are just not in my awareness anymore. And that's quite amazing. And I forget that sometimes how, how hard it was just to be in the world um, at different times in my life. Now, it's not that hard. It's challenging some days, but, you know, I'm... I'm kind of sensitive and I pick up stuff and, you know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, shy and, and something of a hermit when I'm allowed to be. So, yeah, everything's changed. That's all I know. I live in a different place. I have a different community of people. I have different work. But, you know, at that time, when the first book was dictated, I was teaching at NYU and I was running a graduate program at Goddard College in Vermont simultaneously. And if it wasn't for my teaching in, in cl the classroom at NYU, in retrospect, was really my spiritual training more than I ever would have. It was my, or my spiritual practice. My spiritual practice was showing up for others and being of service. And I'm naturally selfish, you know, but mm -hmm. I actually loved it. And I was good at it. And I really did. I learned about love, I think, in the classroom. And the administrative work that I did at Goddard was useful as well. But Goddard, I had dreams about that place when I was nine years old, which was a very dark year. And I saw it for the first time when I was 13, so knew it existed, which floored me. And then when I was 30, I think is when they invited me to apply, invited me to apply for a job to teach there, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I ended up there and I, it was the place that I had dreamt about when I was a child. And it, it's actually the energy of that place is, is wild and it was a bit of a vortex and I wasn't the only one who knew that and had those experiences with that place. But I, I, you know, something about those years always reminded me that I was where I was supposed to be because I had dreamt about this place when I was a child and here I was now. And even if nothing else made sense, maybe I was where I was supposed to be. And it was Victoria Nelson, who was a, a colleague at Goddard, who's the one who was encouraged me because I had the worst writer's block of anybody I've ever met in my life to write um, a story, my memoir about my psychic stuff. And I said, I'm not gonna write anything. And then the guides piped in, we were on the phone and she, they said, well, we have a book to write. And if you take two weeks, we'll do it. And mm -hmm. so that's what allowed the books to happen was that connection in that school, that little universe there. So, you know, um, everything was as it was supposed to be. It's different now. I live in a beautiful place on an island that I thought I would never come to. I mean, I still don't know how to drive, you know. I'm right, still I heard that. A year to learn how to drive. I'm horribly slow. I'm still single and complain about it all the time. But that's me, I'm sure, more than anything. I'm in a much lighter body than I used to walk around, and that feels very good. Um, and I take a different care of myself than I ever did. 
And some of that, I think, is a version of self-love, to value yourself enough not to, you know, to not to hurt yourself and you don't have to. But I'm still learning. I'm not done yet. You know, I tend not to trust people who announce themselves as having ascended. Because I think people that have ascended probably aren't having any need to announce it. They're just being themselves. And, um, you know, the ones I find, the people that I've encountered are the most, or that seem to be the most awake are the ones who just are being, you know. Right. So, you know, but we live in a world where people, I don't know, where, where there's spiritual commerce and all those things. And I get, you know, I'm fortunate I, I do make my living doing this work now. But you know what? I did it for 18 years in my apartment. People put 10 bucks in a basket. Right. And on a good night, I could buy a pizza, you know? Right. I love that. So that's what I did. But I did it anyway. And, and honestly, if there were only three people showing up now, I'd still do it. So that's what I right. did. Right. I agree. I, I'm i with you. It's when you have that, it's in you. And it's, I'll do it. I'll do it all day long. I help um, teenagers. And I'll sit, I'll sit here if there's, I don't care. I'll with one for the rest of the, <laughs> I just want to do that. I want to help these kids. So it's just in me. Like I see it. I will sit there in a room and with three people or whatever. So let's go to um, where, so I want to go to 2020. And so you've written your books where mm -hmm. you're it, you went to Costa Rica. Uh, you had an apartment in New York. 2020 yeah. came shut down. Mm -hmm. Couldn't get back. Let's go there. And then I think, why I want to go there is because I want to start talking about resurrection too, but I want to explain because I I believe 2020 was such a I mean it it was the global pandemic. Oh. We all had some pivots to make. We all had to see where we were being led, mm -hmm. what was calling us, right? Yeah. yeah, I was living in New York. I'd been a New Yorker most of my life. Um. I was working in Costa Rica. I was doing a retreat there. I got out on a, this was right before everything happened, right before everything happened. I mean, I got to the airport with, uh, you know, my assistant to run this event. And there was like, the airport was empty. We're going, wow, this is really wild. So something's really happening now. Four days into this retreat, if that, the New York shut down due to the pandemic. And I really couldn't go home. Um, and I didn't know where to go. And I had just taken a new apartment and my dog was there with the sitter and my stuff was there and, but I ended up on Maui. I had a friend who, at the last minute when I, I said, I don't know where to go. He said, come to Maui. And he's somebody that my guides uh, told me when I first met him that I needed to trust. They almost never do. I said, you need to trust him. And when he said, come to Maui, I said, okay, I trusted him. He found me a little tiny house to stay in. He stocked it with Costco lasagnas, semi <laughs> and um, and I just wound up on Maui, blindsided. Like, how did this happen? I thought I'd be here for two weeks, you know, or until this whole silly thing ended. And uh, right. I never left, really. But my life changed immediately and remarkably. And I have to say, I've never felt so welcomed by a place in my life never had that experience um and i found community here and my work actually not only continued but it grew i'd had a lot of uh live events i was traveling half the month at that time in my life when i was in new york for events and um i felt badly that we had to cancel everything because of covid so as an experiment we just tried moving them online and now I'm doing, you know, a monthly intensive, five-day intensive online, and we've been doing it ever since. And um, they've channeled three books here so far, I think, on the island, and my practice has continued, and now I'm traveling again. But it, it was a remarkable time for me, and it was, you know, it was also the end of, and I'm not deep into astrology at all, but it was my Saturn return, that whole period. Okay. This has also sort of made some other kind of sense given them the amount of change but um yeah it was a big event i was 
forewarned about it. Um, I don't think they mentioned the nature of it, but I was I was on a live stream and I said, the guide said like, um, there's going to be a big event coming and New York is going to be seriously affected and blah, you know, and I thought, you know, I've been in Manhattan for 9-11. They told me about that. They told you that, right? Yeah, that's, they told I, you about the 9-11. Yeah. Yeah, which I, at the time, because I don't get usually, get, I got that through the back door. My ex wanted to know if his business was going to take right. off in lower Manhattan. The answer was no. Why? There's going to be a terrorist attack in Lower Manhattan. I mean, that's how that came through, through me. But um, anyway, I don't remember what I was saying. I yeah, I said I said I just don't want to be in New York. I said please let me be someplace beautiful. <laughs> that's what mm -hmm. I was really I said let me and my assistant let's be out of New York, someplace beautiful. We were in Costa Rica. It couldn't it doesn't get better. And right. then I ended up here, and you know I. A lot of strange things happened, you know, I, uh, I had a, when I was at Esalen a few years back teaching, I was sort of napping uh, in a healing session that I was getting and I saw a giant monkey staring down at me. And I said to the person who was working, I said, I, there's, a, what, there's a giant monkey staring down. He said, yeah, I was late for the session. I was chanting to Hanuman. I didn't know who Hanuman was. Uh, hmm. But anyway, I got here and I now I'm, you know, my community has really been the Ram Dass community. You know, right. They were very welcoming to me and I'm very grateful for them for, for their kind hmm. conclusion because I was totally out of my element when I came. And yeah. so Probably am, but I still like it. Yeah, I love it. Uh, so let's talk about the resurrection, time mm -hmm. of reckoning. Like, I, there's so many things in this book that I would love for you to. It's it, and why it's so um, it's so captivating is because we are in this state of a reckoning. Like, and I that's why I resonate so much with it. It's the vibration, the tones, the um, the accord, the you know where understanding of you know, the old you know i look at it like we used to talk in my world 3d 5d I, now after reading this it's like we're moving to this next level like it's not even i live there like you do like i don't i don't know what's going on in the news i i know how important like my vibration i'm i'm in nature i see the divine in the trees and the birds and and i do that with my kids like look at everything and see the divine we are all that and it's just evolved so much. And this book just takes that to the next level. Mm -hmm. So let's go to that. Like when you first started getting these uh, downloads from your guides. On this book specifically, or just in general? Whatever you, you tell oh, me. In 2010, I am the word they talked about reckoning. And at the very beginning of the book, they said humanity is at a time of reckoning. And a reckoning is a facing of the self and all of one's creations. And basically that everything that's been created in fear is going to have to be renown or reseen in a higher way. And what they basically teach is they teach it, they call it the upper room, which is they say a level of consciousness or Christ consciousness, if you want to use that phrase. They say it's an octave of vibration above what they call the common field. The common field is reality as we've known it. It's what we've been entrained in and where we've got our lessons. And this field has been caught up in what they say is a false belief in separation. And you move to the next level up, which they call the upper room or the, the higher octave. That's not present there. But because all of our memories and experiences are born in the common field, which has been imbued with separation, everything that we experience is is wrapped up in a false idea so the work that they're doing in this trilogy this final trilogy they call the resurrection trilogy is moving us past that i don't remember what's in resurrection because they've dictated another book which is called the book of innocence since then and they are about 50 pages into what they're now calling the, the last book of the trilogy a world made new that's the title mm -hmm. that's given for it so they're really talking about how reality is altered through consciousness now and through vibrational accord. 
So the work that the guides have been doing with their students from the beginning, which I didn't understand at all, um, has been a work in some ways of, of transposition, transposing the music that we are, the vibration, the tone that we are to be played in a higher experience, a higher expression, a higher octave. They say that any song can be sung in a higher octave, any piece of music can be played in a higher tone. And so they're teaching us how to be the, I guess, ambassadors of that, or to how, how to support what they call a reclamation or a resurrection of the inherent divine. And they always say the inherent divine because they say you can't make anything holy, it already is, but you can deny the divine in anything, and in fact we have. So I channel a lot. The one thing that I give myself a lot of credit for is I've shown up for this stuff often when I don't want to or the last thing I want to do or think about or have to be accountable for. But I continue to show up, so the books for me are these experiences of dictation that now happen publicly, which are always slightly terrifying because the rule has always been is that I don't really go back and edit anything. Maybe in any of the books, three words or so that I mispronounced or clearly dropped like an and in a sentence that required an and because I was speaking so fast, it's all in the recordings. Those are the only edits. We don't go back and fix it and make it politically correct or popular or use even phraseology that people like. My guides have never said, I think, soul contract. And I don't think they've ever talked about fifth dimensional reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They've never mentioned a reptilian or this or right. that's not their stuff. They, they mm -hmm. come with their own, their own baggage. <laughs> seems to be rooted in mysticism and um they say predates christianity although they say the basis of what they're teaching is really the basis of what later became well all all religion basically everything's coming from the same the same genesis so my job is always the same to keep up with the dictation as best i can and to be as clear as I can for the dictation. That's my job as the channel. And I have to remember, and I have to be reminded that I am not the author of the books. They remind me all the time. And so I show up and I have to just say, spirit, put the words in my mouth and like, let it rip. And they do. What's curious about this trilogy so far is they'll often start, I don't know if it's all of the books, but it, I, think, I think it was probably true in Resurrection as well. They begin their lectures generally with a phrase um, in an awakened state or, you know, they, they speak to the reader as if they've already aligned at a level of consciousness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not like this is how you get there. They're speaking to the aspect of us that is already there, which is not the personality structure. Right. You know, the personality doesn't get enlightened. You know, it's like I'm going to get, you know, a hair weave and suddenly I have a full head of hair at the end of my experience. <laughs> you are, this is who we truly are that we've been in denial of and have had a lot of junk precluding the, you're not junk stuff, because some of us probably was very valuable and needed stuff precluding our higher expression. So that seems to be what they're working with through these teachings. So the downloads for me are continual, and then they're framed when they do a book, which is always generally a new teaching, where they have to catch the old readers up somehow. They say they teach in a one-room schoolhouse. They're addressing everybody, which is why you can pick up Resurrection when you haven't read the other books. Um, and then I just hope it all makes sense at the end of the day. And I often don't know. Every time I lecture, I say, did that make sense? <laughs> Every time. What are they? So, have they been in a human body before? Any of the guys? Do they ever tell you that? Yeah, they said they said some of us have been informed, some of us have not. Okay. That's what they've said. They also say that this this um, new wave of awakening is going to take four generations. Yeah, I've heard it for over a year now, two years maybe. They've said this. Yeah. I was, you know, I, I was like, oh, brother, when they when that came out of my mouth, which was publicly in a live stream, I'm going, oh, brother, people are going to be pissed. 
everybody right. wants it to happen now or yesterday or in my lifetime or and this is the good part in my lifetime or why should i bother oh. Which, hmm. well but you know if that's this culture of I want to awaken tomorrow. How can I hack my awakening tomorrow? Exactly. I don't want exactly. to have to do the work, which is deal with my stuff and my responsibility to my actions that we all have to finally deal with. It's not the fun stuff, but I think it comes with the territory. But they did say four generation. I was writing, um, right after they said that I was riding in a car with a couple of people that uh, don't really know my work and, you know, they're your TV people, you know, and um, they were talking about the terrible state of the world. And I, they say, well, Paul, what do your guides say? And I said, well, they say we're going to make it, but it's going to take four generations for us to really awaken to, to, to a new promise. So promise is my work. I remember what they said. And they were interesting people. And one of them said, you know, it took Moses 40 years to lead the Jews out of you know, out of Egypt. And the the reason being was that it would take four generations to forget that they had been slaves. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. But there may be a precedent for this kind of thing. My hope is that, and this I've said as much, you know, that the people that are being born now are coming in with a new awareness, right. you know, and those I of us that. showed up for this work are showing up to help pave the way. And I am the word, the guide said something to the effect of you are the first in a generation, you are first, you are the, you are the first generation, you know, preparing for the changes that are upon you. I, I, I have to look up the quote. It's a good quote. And I have to say that in all of these books, and now I, this is the 12th that they're dictating now, they're horribly consistent. I don't think that they contradict themselves, you know, they continue to build really on the very premise of the first book, which was I am the word. Right. About embodying the inherent divine. And that's still what they're speaking to. When you talk about the children, I have two daughters um, and I work with younger kids. When they, when you say that they're coming in at a different vibration, and I believe that, but when you, when you tap in because you can with your mediumship ability to the children, you, you say, I heard you say somewhere where you hear the kids' voices are like, get me out of here. And they like have those accents or something. Only little kids, babies. So like babies. Yeah, babies. Yeah, babies. babies. Because sometimes people say, Oh, I have a new baby. Would you read for my baby? And I go, Oh yeah. But that's because <laughs> that's how the babies show up. Babies show up most of the time. Like I used to say, old Jewish diamond merchants, oi, get me out of here. Oh, I, why did I come back? Oh no. It's very <laughs> Hey, these little old people showing up. Look, oh, how did I get? Oh, who's there? Oh, there she is again. Oh, no. It's very funny. And then there's a time when they feel like kids and the vocabulary goes. You don't hear them in the same way. Baby talk isn't, you know, you can, you can get, get a sense of what's going on, but, you know, I don't hear them in, in the same way that I hear an adult. Um, but, you know, I can, I don't like to do pets. People say, would you tune into my cat? I say, okay, I'll do it if you want. I mean, I don't hear them in language. Other people do. And when I get animals, I get, I know what it feels like to be in a horse's body, which is because I can, I feel my body shifts. Yeah. The skeletal structure, all those things happen. It's interesting. And so when I tune into like, what's wrong with my pug? And I tune into the pug and I, he's, you know, he's constipated. That's what's wrong. So I can feel it. It's, you know, impacted, yeah. you know. So stuff like that, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but yeah, babies are babies <laughs> are interesting. But you know, so are people. I don't do a lot of this anymore. There was a, I was on a television show years ago called The Unexplained when it was on the History Channel. Um, and I, was, I had to step into um, people. There was a show, the premise of the show was people who had problems that couldn't be solved by normal means. And they brought in people with odd abilities to see if we could support them. And there was a woman, just a lovely woman, came to my apartment. There's a whole camera crew there. I don't know what's going on. All I knew was she had a problem. So I think she said it with her husband and her son. And kids are easier to read because they don't mask as much. You know, right. they're pretty open. So I, I, I usually use the name. So I stepped into the kid, the kid, and. 
I began to rock and my hands clawed up and I went deaf, I couldn't hear. I didn't know what the hell was going on, I'm rocking in the chair and hitting myself, you know? Huh. And it turned out the kid had cerebral palsy and they intercut me with the kid and it was a mirror of what the kid was doing. And wow. he, he was at home in Connecticut and he had never, and I kept, but I kept hearing him, which was the interesting thing. And I kept hearing, get me out of my body, get me out of here. I was like, uh, no, get me out of here, get me out. And I'm thinking, what is wrong? Is that I, and I didn't know if the kid was in prison, psychotic, I didn't know what was, and because I had no information. I didn't know until halfway through the reading what was really happening here. So I said, is he deaf? I'm losing my hearing. And she's saying, we don't know. And I'm going, what is going on here? Lovely woman, a very hard situation with a child. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what was so remarkable was he had never spoken, and I was hearing him. You oh, know, wow. I wasn't hearing what anybody wanted to hear. He'd never spoken a word in his life, but I could hear him. And, you know, people are interesting. People aren't, you know, sometimes people would come. When I had a, an office in New York, and people would come to me in person. I remember somebody coming in once, lovely woman, big smile, happy as can be. I tuned into her, and I was so angry. I got furious <laughs> and i said boy you're angry and she said i am not well i'm not going to go you know i'm not going to make her wrong but i knew you know people are funny we have our stuff i'm sure i have my stuff still that we seek to protect right right what about your mom with dementia can you get into her i don't and i don't i've never tuned in i don't want to tune into my mother it's too weird for me and okay. maybe that's my stuff i've tuned into a lot of people with dementia um, other people's parents in my work, um, and Alzheimer's. And there's a place that many of them get to that's quite lovely, actually, where it's just kind of peaceful. It's like you can watch a snowflake fall for two hours out the window and be interested. And there's something very, very present moment about the whole way of experiencing time as eternity without all the stuff where it's hard, I think, especially, is when people are losing facilities and are frightened by that. Um, but honestly, the relationship with my, my mother is too close, not physically close, but it's too enmeshed for me to do a neutral read. And I generally don't read, and people are always surprised that I don't read. Like if, I'm, if I have a date and they're late, I might tune in to see if they're going to show up or they got stuck in traffic. Oh, wow. That, okay. I might see, get that, but it never occurs to me to tune into the people in my life. I just don't, it doesn't like, why would I want to do that? It's only when I'm working. And then I even then have to make a distinction of what I can and won't do. People want to know, is my spouse cheating on me? I'm not a psychic spy. I can see how they feel about, I can give you what's available to me, but I'm not gonna go peek under the sheets, you know, on somebody's right. behalf. I did a, this TV show, this radio show, Coast to Coast AM, like the first mm -hmm. time I did it. Uh, it was a call-in show and some guy said, so I wanna know if I have my, my wife's having an affair and I got the gun waiting here by myself. <laughs> the am not oh. there. Not gonna go with a hunting rifle guy. <laughs> can't do that, not what I do. Anyway. Oh my gosh, funny. Yeah, I just, you know, when I think of um, your gifts and, you know, you where you're going and what, where I can see how many more books you're going to write and all the things, but I, I was, so let's go to, I want to talk about, because there are all these uh, interdimensional beings are being come up to the surface lately, but, you know, like the last few years, it's all, all the darkness is coming to the light and they keep, they don't, but the guides don't talk to us about the aliens or the, you know, it's, it's more just, it, we're moving to the upper room. We see the divine in everything. It's an attunement, the vibrant, all that. They're not spiritual bypassing. I don't think they're right. doing that, but they do say again and again and again, who you put in darkness, what you put in darkness calls you to the darkness. What you damn and who you damn damns you back. Self-righteousness is always the small self or the personality self. And those are hard teachings. And we live in a very polarized 
culture right now and people want to make everybody else wrong. And I think we can do that, but I think we do a lot of that at our own peril. Um, their teachings of forgiveness um, are hard. And it's not, I forgive you, everything's okay. It doesn't matter that you, you know, ran over my dog in the driveway and didn't stand. So it's not like that, you know. But it is, it is an understanding that who you put in darkness, who you damn, what you deny, who you deny God in, you deny the God in yourself immediately. You cannot, this is a simple quote, you cannot be the light and hold another in darkness. That doesn't mean that there aren't, you know, astral thingamajigs and, you know, stuff flying around. But the way you attend to this stuff is you keep your vibration high. Right. You know, I mean, you can't. Now, that's how I look at it. You know, somebody once said to me, an old medium friend of mine who was trained, she said, you know, you don't pick anything up when you're going up. It's when you're coming back down. That's when you pick up the, the astral straggler stuff. So I don't, you know, I don't put my attention there. Mm -hmm. I think people like it. When anybody says to me, I am a spiritual warrior, I know that there's trouble because that's somebody who's looking for a fight or looking for something to battle. Right. And that doesn't mean that if we see an injustice, we may act, we may be called to act to remedy that or to bring light to it. This is a deep process now of bringing light to where the light has been denied, but not to blame it, but to change it, to transform it. Nothing is changed when it's hidden in shadow. So the process of bringing it to the light, which is challenging, and I think we have to do this as individuals, we have to go through this uncomfortable process of seeing our own stuff, where we stand in the way, where we deny the divide in ourselves and others. Um, as much as the whole world is having to do that with its creation. So the luxury of I get to be right and make them wrong might last a little bit and give you a nice sense of self importance, but does it really heal or remedy anything? Right. And I think when we stop hurting ourselves and hurting each other, we have a much, much, much better chance as a species. How would you say, I heard you answer this question, and, and I think people are listening now thinking, well, how do I connect to the divine? How do I get, how do I connect to that? How do I get to the upper room? Oh, well, you know, oh. I'm, the guides use attunements as, 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 but not as a trick. The attunements are energetic codes in some ways that support alignment, but it's not a magic wand and it's not a magic trick. If you want to have a spiritual life, ask for it. If you want to wake up, ask for it. If you want to know God, allow God to know you, you know, give permission. I think we have to give permission. I asked, you know, I asked when I was 25, um, on I'm a not, piece of paper or in nope, your mind? Nope, 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 nope. I heard there was this thing happening called the harmonic convergence. Oh, yes, now, yes. Because, you know, now every other, every other Friday is some big celestial event. But at the time, I didn't know any better. And I just heard people are going to wake up. And I thought, well, if there is a God or something like a God, and you ask to be woken up, why would it want to say no? didn't make any sense to me. So I went up to the roof of the building that I lived in the night before this event. Somebody gave me a crystal. Somebody gave me a mantra. And I asked. And I tried to teach myself to meditate using the mantra I'd been given. I didn't even know what a mantra was. And I had an experience of energy moving through me, which was palpable. And in retrospect, it just may have been breath work. You know, it was a, but it was a Kundalini mantra. I didn't even know that. Hmm. And... Um, but I had this experience of this energy moving through me and sort of being frozen up on the roof. And <laughs> for me, it was important because it was a tangible event. I didn't wake me up, but it helped me to trust that there was more than I had thought. If nothing, if that was the only gift, I'll take it. And then the little light started showing up around people shortly after that. So something got moved, I suppose. But ask, you know, I don't know that you need a formal way. I think if it comes from the heart and it's a prayer, it's heard, you know, and, but ask to be woken up 
I didn't ask to be woken up. I just didn't want to be in pain the way I'd been. So for me, I was told to stop drinking. Right. My God. Or I was. I mean, you did right away. Like you went. Oh, I'm going to do I, it. I heard where to go, and I went where they told me, and I did it. That's what happened, and I was very, very, very fortunate, and probably, and or maybe crazy. I was 25, you know, and um, but I did, I did take the action. And I am an old time believer and take the action and turn the results over to God. So you ask God and then you say, okay, now if there's something for you to do on your own, or if you ask God to wake up and then suddenly you're walking down the street and somebody invites you to a meditation group, maybe you might, maybe you might want to go. Right, exactly. Other people too. So I don't know, I don't know that there's a trick to this. The books that come through seem to help people, but thank God they're not the only way because then there'd be nobody. And mm-hmm. uh, I think people go where they're led and where they're called to, you know. I, so many people don't listen to that voice and are well, like sleepwalking. Yeah, so what? You know, maybe that's where they need to be. Right, exactly. And um, I, there are areas in my life where I, I don't think I want to fully know yet. And maybe one day I will. When I be, as I become willing, I assume. Willingness is the key. My guides don't tell me what to do. They will encourage me, not wise, not a good idea, but the choice finally is mine to make um, because we have free will and I believe that that's honored. And I think spirit will work with you if you say I am willing to be worked with. Just make sure it's somebody, it's got somebody to say. I mean, I have to say this to people, but just because somebody, somebody does, just because somebody doesn't have a body means you should not necessarily listen to them. You know what I mean? You know, my, my grandma, I always say this, who's been dead many years, was married about four times. She's probably not who I want to go to for relationship advice on the other side. She might be very happy to give it to me. So, you know, bless her. Um, But yeah, I think prayer is good. And prayer is just communication. You do it from the heart. So Right. Yeah. And, you know, when we... When we talk about this is my I'm, we're, we're coming to the end here, but when we you talk about the, or they talk about the four generations, is there a way we can bypass that and get there with in our own soul living in that upper room and yeah, living I, in- I think they're teaching us that now I think they're talking about what they're talking about four generations collective change. You know they're teaching a world made new now, whatever that means i'm i'm only. We just, I haven't counted up the pages, but I think they've dictated about 47 pages and five or five days or so of, of teaching so far. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, some of it's up to you. Some of it, I think, is at a soul level, what you can manage, what you came to do. I don't know that everybody comes to wake, awaken fully to their true nature in a lifetime, but I think the groundwork gets laid sometimes. I don't really know, but um, I, I don't know. I think the part of one that wants to rush it or get it, you know, the guides have said to people when they raise their hands and say, I want this to be my last lifetime. The guides say, well, then you get to come back. <laughs> right. I get it. Because we're so attached to, to outcome and that's the personality. So, right. Right. The one thing I was, it, that was interesting to me was how you describe or how they describe the frame and everything you you manifest, you, you expect, and it's in this frame. Yeah. I love that. That was such a great a way of te- le- seeing in that. Yeah, it's, it's a good teaching. We get what we expect. They've said it again and again. Right. All right, Paul, this has been an amazing hour. I appreciate you. This Thanks. is just a gift, a gift for me. So amazing. So honored. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. You're so welcome. And they can find you on paulselig.com. Basically, yeah, that's, that's the best place. Up there. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Paul. Bye-bye. Bye.